minutes. And so let's give a big bent tree welcome to Dr. Mike Lacona. Thank you, Father. Hey, thank you, and good morning, everyone. I am just thrilled to be here, and um, it's the first time I've been at Bentry, so thanks for your warm uh, reception. Um, you know, my first encounter with an atheist, at least my first known encounter with an atheist, was when I was in a, a freshman in college during spring break in 1980. 33 years ago, whoa. I remember I was down um, on the Gulf Coast, and I, I lived in Maryland at the time, but I was down in the Gulf Coast, and I was walking along the beach with a colleague of mine, and I said, hey, let's go share Christ with some people. And so we came up to this guy who was probably in his late 50s, and I started sharing the gospel with him, and he says, well, I'm an atheist. And I responded, well, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. <laughs> Not a good answer. And so he said, well, I don't believe the Bible. And I said, well, um, you have a nice day. <laughs> I had no idea where to go at that point. I ended up having several other conversations like that in the years that would follow. And there came a point when I said, you know, I, I can't let that happen anymore. I need to get some answers. And then as I started studying this, you know, and really started to investigate the evidence for Christianity and look at the evidence for other religions and consider the arguments for atheism, I started to, to wonder myself and say, well, how do I know Christianity is true? I mean, after all, if I'd been born in Afghanistan, maybe I'd be a Muslim. If I had been born in France or Germany or England, maybe I'd be an atheist. If I'd been if I'd been born into a family that had a negative experience with the church, maybe I'd be a skeptic of some sort. Maybe if I'd been born in India, maybe I'd be a Hindu. And it's like all these things you put together and you say, there's so many different things that would contribute to us believing the way we do. You know, how do I know that what I believe is true? And it really started to bother me. So I started investigating this. And uh, that led me into a PhD program in which I was going to really investigate the resurrection of Jesus and um, try to, to do it as objective and open-minded as possible. Because I figured, you know, we don't have to fear truth, do we? The truth is the truth. If Christianity is false, I want to know. Let me find out and just go find something else to do if that's the case. If Christianity is true, well, then I want to know if it's true. I don't have to fear truth. And so I really started to look at this, and I just became obsessed with it. In the process, I ended up uh, intentionally... Uh, seeking to have public debates with atheists and agnostics and Muslims. Um, and the reason I wanted to do it, one of the main reasons is because I wanted to subject what I was learning and the, the method and the conclusions that I was, that I was coming to. Um, I wanted to subject them to unsympathetic authorities. Some of the leading ones out there, like Elaine Pagels at Princeton who teaches there, uh, Bart Ehrman who teaches at UNC Chapel Hill, the most influential skeptical New Testament uh, scholar in North America, Shabir Ali, the leading Muslim debater in the world. I figured, you know, I've got my blind spots, but they don't have the same blind spots. They have their own. So arguments that I may think are strong, they may, if they're not that strong, they're going to see that. They'll point out some things. So, and before all my debates, I would, I would pray and say, God, if I'm wrong, show me. I, you know, if, if Christianity is false and some other religion is true, I am really open. I don't care if you have to humiliate me. Whatever it takes, I want to know truth because the eternal destiny of my soul is that important to me. Um, so I continue to study research. And um, you have to understand now, I, I was a gifted student. So in high school and college, when they gave me a C, it was a gift. I have an average IQ. My dad told me what it is. I'd share the number with you, but I forgot it. All right. Um, I, about eight years ago, I discovered that I have ADD, which means attention deficit squirrel. <laughs> and so it made it really hard. I mean, all of that that I've just told you is absolutely true. Um, so I had some kind of learning disabilities in that sense. When I was in college and grad school to write a 20-page double-spaced paper was an absolute nightmare to me. 
But my doctoral dissertation ended up being over 700 pages long with more than 2,000 footnotes. And the reason being, I just became obsessed with the question. I had to know whether Jesus rose from the dead. So what's interesting, I, I'm not here to talk about the resurrection this morning, but as I started to debate atheists and agnostics and skeptics, a lot of times their primary objection against Christianity would be against the historical reliability of the gospel. So I started to look into that even more. And um, in debating Bart Ehrman several times, he would use five major objections against the gospels. And so I developed a lengthy lecture called the ABCs, D's and E's of defending the Gospels, and it would answer those five major objections. I don't have time to share all five with you, but this morning I'm going to go through the ABCs of defending the Gospels. I'm going to present Ehrman's three major objections against the historical reliability of the Gospels and, and give you some answers for that. And why? Because... These objections have led many to have a shipwrecked faith, and I want to protect you from that, and I want to, to arm you for that, and if you're a seeker in here and you've had these kinds of questions, I want to give you some what I think would be reasonable answers and just some things for your consideration. I'm going to be mentioning Bart Ehrman, but these arguments were not invented by his. I only mention him because I've debated him a few times and because he is the most influential skeptical New Testament scholar in North America today. And... Um, but he has popularized these. And every time he writes a book, it becomes a New York Times bestseller within the first two weeks. That's how popular Ehrman is. I like Bart Ehrman. He's fun to, we've had dinner a couple times together. We get along. So I like the guy. I just think his arguments stink. <laughs> I'm going to show you why this morning, okay? So let's jump right into this. Um, and uh, the first one is A. A stands for authorship. And here's what the authorship of the Gospels, and I'm confining what we're talking about this morning to the Gospels, because that's what he attacks. Authorship of the Gospels. He says, we don't know who wrote the Gospels because they're anonymous documents. When you look at the original or the oldest manuscripts we have of the Gospels, or let's say this, when we look at the New Testament, we open our New Testament, it will say the Gospel according to Matthew at the very beginning, the Gospel according to Mark, the Gospel according to Luke, according to John. Ehrman says that the original manuscripts don't have those titles. Actually, we don't know because we don't have the original manuscripts. Um, and we don't know when they vanished. It was sometime after the year 200. Um, but we know we had them probably up until about that time. But the oldest manuscripts of the Gospels we have today don't have the titles there. And so Ehrman contends, and others contend, that the Gospels are anonymous. We have no idea who wrote them. Well, let's talk about that conclusion that he comes to. It's probably true. It is probably true that the original manuscripts do not have the titles there, the Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And none of the Gospels have the names of the authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, as their authors and claiming to be authors, the authorship there. So I want to look first, does this really make a difference? So I want to apply this to a guy, first of all, named Plutarch. Plutarch was an ancient biographer who wrote toward the end of the first century, beginning of the second century. He wrote between the years 70 and 120, right around in that range. He wrote more biographies that have survived from that period than anyone else. In fact, he wrote a little over 60 biographies, 50 of which have survived, and much of what we know about the ancient Greco-Roman world comes from Plutarch. Anyone pregnant in here? Huh? Anyone? Oh, okay. Great. Do you know if it's a boy or girl? A girl? Okay. Ah, Plutarch wouldn't be a good name for a girl. But, you know, if any of you are pregnant or you have a son later on or you're, someone's pregnant, you're going to have a son, Plutarch, just remember that name. It's a pretty nice name, don't you think? Okay. So Plutarch, very good writer, too. You can read his, his biographies. They're called Lives. They didn't used to call them biography in the first century. It wouldn't be a biography of Caesar. It would be a, the life of Caesar. That's what they called him, a life. So... Um, we learn a lot from Plutarch and about the ancient world. Well, of the 50 biographies of Plutarch that have survived, guess how many times his name appears in them? Never does. Really? Not once? Nope. Zero? Zilch? Nada. Nothing. Well, then how is it we know Plutarch wrote those? Very good question. I'm glad you asked it. There are a couple reasons. First of all, we have manuscript tradition from antiquity that attributes these to Plutarch. 
Could they have gotten it wrong? Yes. But we still have this testimony that Plutarch wrote these. We also have what's called the Lamprius Catalog that's dated in the third to fourth century that lists all of Plutarch's writings. Now, Lamprius was supposed to be Plutarch's grandson. But here's the thing, Plutarch lived, he died just after 120. Do you really think his grandson is gonna be writing the third to fourth century? I mean, he's gonna be dead long before then. So we really don't know who wrote the Lamprius Catalog. We still have all Plutarch's writings attributed to him. But you know what, despite this, modern historians who study the Greco-Roman world don't at all question whether Plutarch wrote these. It seems like there's decent enough reason to believe that Plutarch is the author of this. And there's no one else who comes along and says, oh, it wasn't Plutarch, it was Ovid or someone, you know, who wrote these. No, Plutarch is the only one that this is a tribute, person that these lives are attributed to. And so Greco-Roman historians of today say, Plutarch wrote these, they have no problems with it. Now, and, and again, his name doesn't appear at all within any of these 50 surviving biographies. Here's what Mark Edwards, who teaches at Oxford University, here's what he writes. It is sometimes wrongly said that the gospels are anonymous because the author is not named in the proem. A nodding acquaintance with Plato, Plutarch, Lucian, or Porphyry, to take a few names at random, would have undeceived the victims of this error. So we can see what Ehrman and others are claiming, that we don't know who wrote the gospel simply because their names don't appear in them. Doesn't mean we don't have a clue who wrote them. That's the way it is with many, many ancient authors. Okay, so now we know how scholars think Plutarch wrote these. Where do we come up with the idea that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the gospels? Another fine question. Let's look at the answer for this. First of all, and I don't expect you to, to read all this, it's very small font, but I try to fit all this on here just to make a point. The first person to tell us about the authorship of the Gospels is a guy named Papias, and he writes around the year 120, and he mentions the authorship of Matthew and Mark. Next, we have a guy named Marcion. He was actually a heretic, and he writes around the year 145, and Marcion uh, talked about the authorship of the Gospel of Luke. A few years after that, you have a guy named Justin. He was later killed for his faith, so we call him Justin Martyr. And he talks about the authorship of Matthew and Luke. I'm sorry, Mark and Luke. Irenaeus. That's another name for you to remember if you have a son someday. Irenaeus. All right. And Irenaeus is the first one to come out with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's the first one to report that around the year 170. And then it just keeps on going on from there and on and on up until you get origin in the year 225. He talks about the Gospel of Mark. And then it just keeps even going past that. But what I want you to see through all of this is the early church fathers were a single voice in saying who wrote the Gospels. They attributed to them to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There was no dissenting voice. No one said Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Fred or George. There's always Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's just a single voice. There's no competing testimony out there. And you got to hold that pretty highly. I mean, the burden of proof, therefore, rests on anyone who's going to claim something to the contrary. We have better evidence, better evidence that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John wrote those Gospels than we had that Plutarch wrote uh, the 50 biographies we have that have survived. So, does this mean that all the early church fathers were correct? No, it doesn't. We know the early church fathers get some things wrong. So, what about that? What do we do with this? Um, the early, the, the uh, traditional authorship says that Matthew was one of the 12 disciples. He was the tax collector. They say that Mark was not a disciple of Jesus, but he got his information from one of the 12. He got it from Mark, the lead apostle. So, he has the memoirs of Peter here, basically. Luke was not an eyewitness, but he got his information from the eyewitnesses. Luke himself says this within the first four verses of his gospel. And then John, the early church attributes to the beloved disciple as being John, the son of Zebedee, um, one of the 12 disciples. All right, so we've got good testimony that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the gospels, all right? But there's still a possibility that they didn't because sometimes the early church fathers got it wrong. So the question is, what if then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not write the Gospels attributed to them? What does that do to the historical reliability of the Gospels? Not much, to be honest with you. Now let's look at why. Number one, 
Even when the Gospels aren't attributed to a particular author, on many occasions, the Gospels are quoted by the early church fathers, say like Justin, and referred to as either the memoirs of the apostles or the memoirs for short. So the early church, even if they didn't attribute them uh, to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they still uh, regarded these within just a few decades of them being written as the memoirs of the apostles. That apostolic testimony was definitely behind these. Second, in the Gospels, now what I'm about to discuss with you for probably the next three minutes is the most technical thing that I'm going to be saying this morning. So just hang with me. It's only about three minutes, okay? Scholars today, even conservative New Testament scholars, recognize that the Gospels, in many cases, like in the case of Mark, I'm sorry, in the case of Matthew and Luke, had sources that they were using. Why would they do this? Well, this is just the thing that you would do in antiquity. Even if you were an eyewitness, you would want to use sources of it all possible. It would give uh, uh, some credibility to your writings. Most scholars believe that Matthew and Luke used Mark as one of their sources. So even though Matthew is the first gospel that appears in our New Testament, most scholars today, not all, but most, believe that Mark wrote his gospel first. So if you could go to the next slide, you can see that um, Matthew and Luke seem to use Mark as one of their sources. And for reasons I just can't get into, you can kind of identify this throughout the Gospels when Matthew, Mark, Luke almost appear word for word, okay? And they look at that and say, okay, Matthew and Luke are using Mark here. Well, we can kind of we, uh, test them at this point to see how closely they're sticking to Mark um, or how much they're paraphrasing or altering what Mark may have said. And if that, we can see that they're sticking very, very closely to Mark when they use him, and in fact, more closely to him than other ancient uh, sources, uh, other ancient historians stick to their sources. Now, of course, you might say, well, why would Matthew, if he was one of the 12, why would he have to use Mark since Mark was not an eyewitness? We got to remember that there were occasions when, since Mark is writing for Peter, there were occasions when Peter was at events that Matthew wasn't like the transfiguration, right? Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him. Matthew's not there. So if this is the memoirs of Peter, it would be in Matthew's best interest to quote or uh, take a source which is considered authoritative, the memoirs of Peter recorded by Mark, and to use them since they would have known Peter was an eyewitness. So that would have been one of the reasons they could have, he, he could have used it. All right, but we can see that they stick very carefully to their sources. There are other times when you'll find Matthew and Luke report a story, but it's not in Mark. That means there's another source involved here. Whether Matthew and Luke were using a common source, or whether, say, Luke was using Matthew, it's still a separate source from Mark. So, again, this is kind of technical, and I, I don't want to get bogged down on it, but at the absolute minimum, even skeptical New Testament scholars say that there are a minimum of two independent sources, and some say that there are even four, maybe even five independent sources in the Gospels. So even if we didn't know who wrote the Gospels, we have between two and five independent sources. Now, why is that important? Most of what we find reported in antiquity is reported by a single source. You can't confirm it then as having occurred, but when you have two independent sources reporting the same event that makes the, the historical likelihood of that occurring much more likely. With many of the things that we see about Jesus, we have two to five independent sources, and that's very strong. And again, we see that these guys are sticking very closely to their sources, which means when they're reporting things that we can't test them by, they should get the nod, the benefit of the doubt to say they're not inventing this stuff. They are sticking carefully to what actually occurred that they know to have occurred. And then finally, you have what are called, uh, we, can, we have numerous data in the Gospels that can be corroborated. Non-Christian sources of the period. We have a minimum of nine non-Christian sources writing within 150 years of Jesus who give us a brief outline, a basic outline of the life of Jesus that we can read about in them. And that corroborates a lot of things that we read in the Gospels. Also, um, there are what are called criteria for authenticity that historians use. They're just common sense criteria 
Are the reports early? Are they by eyewitnesses? Are there multiple independent sources? Do we have external sources that are unsympathetic to Christianity? Are there sources that are kind of embarrassing to the Christian faith that report these things? All these things together, and the more these criteria that are fulfilled, the greater likelihood we have that they're reporting actual history. It's kind of like Peter uh, denying Jesus. Why, if you are inventing a story, why would you cast your church leader in such a negative light? Why would you have Jesus turn at one point and call Peter Satan? <laughs> You're not going to make that kind of stuff up. All right, so it's those embarrassing kind of details that, you know, kind of lead historians to say, hmm, they're really trying to report accurate history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, someone might say, well, maybe they were doing that in order to get us to mislead us and do that as a trick to get us to think that it's historically reliable. Well, now you're looking back from the 21st century that way. Remember, they're situated in the first century. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not sit on this committee and try to figure out how can we mislead future historians. They were writing according to the rules of their day, and they're including some embarrassing things, which is most likely true, or else they wouldn't have included them. So the, here's the thing. Even if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not write the Gospels, there's still good enough reason to believe that they contain historically reliable information in them. All right, now let's get off some of that technical stuff and move on. That's A for authorship. B, bias. Ehrman says that bias in the gospel accounts, you know, these are all written by Christians and so we really can't believe them. In fact, John says, I'm writing these things in order that you may believe. So John is writing these things with the distinct purpose of converting people to Christianity. In other words, it's propaganda. So we shouldn't believe it, Ehrman would say, and others would say. Well, when I was doing my doctoral studies, I discovered that virtually all historians agree that every historian is biased. That there is no such thing as a completely objective, neutral historian. They're all writing because they have an objective behind it. Um, they're all writing about an issue because they're interested in it. And if we're going to reject of uh, the reports of people just because they're biased, that would mean that we could never have a Jewish historian write about the Holocaust. We could never have an African-American historian write about slavery in the United States. We could never have a homosexual or a lesbian write on gay marriage or, or gay rights, because they're all biased, right? Bias doesn't mean you're wrong, but we're biased with so many things, even sports, it doesn't matter. We are very, very biased on a lot of different things. So it's not a matter of bias that means something's wrong. It could lead to bad conclusions, but not necessarily. Garrett Ludeman is an atheist New Testament scholar, and he wrote a book called The Resurrection of Christ in 2004. In that book, he says this. It's, the aim of this book was to prove the non-historicity of the resurrection of Jesus and simultaneously to encourage Christians to change their faith accordingly. Is Ludeman biased? Does he have an agenda in his writing? It's propaganda, right? Does that mean he's wrong? No, it just means he's wrong because his arguments stink, not because he's biased and this is propaganda. Let's look at another one. Uh, this is Richard Dawkins. He's one of those militant atheists. Just Google him. You can see his picture. He's got this sour look on his face like he's been sucking on a pickle. <laughs> Dawkins says this in his book, The God Delusion. He says, if this book works as I intend... Religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. Is, is Dawkins biased? Does he have an agenda? Does that mean he's wrong? No, he's wrong because his arguments stink, but he's, he's still biased, that doesn't mean he's wrong. If Jesus actually was the divine son of God, if he performed miracles, if he rose from the dead, are really Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are they really being evil because they're biased and wanting to get Jesus the message, the very best message one could ever hear about how to have eternal life and be reconciled to God? Is it really bad that this propaganda is being spread by them? It doesn't mean you're wrong just because you're biased. Just because you have a message to share doesn't mean that you're wrong. People who were directing others on the Titanic to leave, there's the, the boats, the lifeboats. You want to be saved? Get in the lifeboat. There it is. All right, that's propaganda. They're doing this. They're trying to persuade people to go save themselves. That doesn't mean their message is wrong. 
All right, let's move on to the third one, C. This is the most important one, contradictions. Now, when I debated Ehrman, he did a lot to focus on contradictions and say that this really discredits the Gospels as historically reliable sources. So I started to look into this more and more because I saw it was bothering the faith of Christians. So I've spent the last four and a half years looking at this. Now, I'll be 52 this July, and so I've been a Christian since age 10, so that's about 42 years. And I've read through the Gospels so much, and you, all of you who have been believers in here for a while know what I'm talking about here, that if you've read them a lot, you know, you start to read them, you can get into this thing, rut where you start to read it, and your mind goes on autopilot, because you know what's coming up, right? So one exercise I've been doing over the last four and a half years to help me concentrate more is to read the Gospels in Greek. When I was in grad school and doing my PhD in New Testament, you have to be able to read these things in Greek, so you have to learn Greek. So I'm reading them in Greek multiple times, and as I start to do this, it really slows me down. It forces me to look at every word, every phrase, every sentence, every paragraph very carefully. And as I do this, all of a sudden, differences in the Gospels are just jumping out at me like never before. So I figured, you know, I better start making notes of these. So I started doing that, and that document started growing and growing. And that document today, four and a half years later, is more than 50 pages that's how many differences so far I've found in the Gospels, and I'm finding new ones all the time. So what do we do with these? What do we do with these differences? Ehrman will say things like, you know, you just can't trust these Gospels because of this. I mean, what are some of these differences? Well, Ehrman will point out, and others point out, was Jesus crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning or just after noon? Well, Mark says just after, or at 9 o'clock, John says just after noon. Which one's correct? Well, it depends which one you read. Was Jesus crucified the day after the Passover meal, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke say? Or was it the day of the Passover meal, like John says? Depends which gospel you read. Jesus is crucified between two thieves. Did both thieves curse him, as Mark say, says? Or does one thief say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, as Luke says? Depends which one you're reading. When the women go to the empty tomb on Sunday morning, was it just Mary Magdalene, like John says, or was it multi were there multiple women like the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke say? Depends which one you're reading. Um, how many angels were at the tomb? Matthew and Mark say one, Luke and John say two. Which one is true? Where did Jesus first appear to his disciples? Was it in Galilee, like Matthew uh, uh, reports and, and Mark suggests? Or was it in Jerusalem, like Luke and John say? Depends which one you're reading. Did Jesus appear to them over a period of time, like Matthew and John say? Or did Jesus rise from the dead, appear to all his disciples on Easter, and even ascend on Easter, like Luke says? Well, it depends which one you read. And by the time the skeptic gets through all this, we're here saying, say it ain't so. How can this be? How can I trust these gospels when they have these kinds of differences in them? Well, I've been studying these again for the last four and a half years, and I'm finding some very interesting things. I want to just share with you three brief uh, principles I want you to keep in mind. The first is we have to look at the historical importance of contradictions in the Gospels, or any ancient literature, to be honest with you. So I'm saying if we can't reconcile these at all, and I think we can in most cases, if not all, but if we couldn't do anything to reconcile these, what does this mean? Well, 101 years ago, the Titanic sank. And when it sank, eyewitnesses contradicted one another on a pretty interesting detail. Some said the ship broke in half and then sank. Others said, no, it didn't. It went down in one piece. Now, how do you get that wrong? It's the most terrifying night of your life. You're out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There's only one thing you can see. It's a little over 800 feet long. It's all lit up, and screams are coming from it. How do you get it wrong? Some say it breaks in half, and then it sinks. The other said, no, it went down in one piece. No, it didn't. I was there. I saw it. It broke in half. Hey, are you forgetting, knucklehead? I was there, too. I saw it. It went down in one piece. Two, one, two. What, what's going on here? I'm sure when they were talking to these, nobody turned around and said, well, I guess the Titanic didn't sink. They said, no, there's some peripheral details. We know the Titanic sank, but there's some minor details. We don't know how they got it messed up, but they did. Eyewitnesses mess things up. Um, last Sunday night, I watched uh, with my wife, we watched uh, Killing Lincoln. And um, she's really into uh, American history. And so we were watching that. And, um, and they said that when uh, Booth shot Lincoln and then jumped down on the stage, and the words he uttered and what he had in his hand and what happened, 
that there were more than 1,500 people who witnessed that, and yet no two eyewitnesses agreed on the details. And of course, that doesn't mean that Booth didn't shoot Lincoln, right? It just means eyewitnesses sometimes get some things wrong on the minor details. We can expect that. And the differences we find in the Gospels between them are no greater than we find between other works of antiquity when they're reporting the same event, such as the suicide of the Roman Emperor Otho, when Tacitus, Suetonius, and Plutarch report it. Same kind of differences that we find amongst the Gospels, believe it or not. So just because you find these differences doesn't mean that these are historically unreliable Gospels, even if you couldn't resolve them, even if these were errors in the minor details. All right? So that's if we couldn't do anything with it. I think we can do some things with it, though. Number two is we have to be able to distinguish between a contradiction and a difference. A contradiction would be something like the Titanic broke in half, the Titanic didn't break in half before it sank. That's a contradiction. You can't reconcile it. A difference. Um, let, let me, uh, instead of going over that, go to the next slide. I'm going to give you a difference here because I, I, I want to be sensitive to my time. A difference would be something like the resurrection narratives in the Gospels. You have things like um, uh, the Gospel of John says, early in the morning while it was still dark on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene gets up and goes to the tomb. She finds it empty. She runs back and she tells Peter and the beloved disciple, they've taken the Lord and we don't know where they've laid him. So you've got Mary going to the tomb. The synop or Matthew, Mark, and Luke say if multiple women go to the tomb and, and so forth, then that's how the story proceeds. So is it multiple women or just Mary Magdalene? Well, John doesn't say just Mary Magdalene. He only mentions her. But it's really interesting if you read the text, verse 2, Mary comes back and she says, they've taken the Lord and we don't know where they've laid him. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. Who's we? Well, why would you just have one there if there are multiple? Well, maybe that's the way they wrote back then. We can find Luke doing the same thing. You see, because John says, when she came back and said that, Peter and the beloved disciple got up and they ran to the tomb and found it just as Mary said. Luke reports the same thing. The women go to the tomb, they find it empty, they came back and they said, guess what, the Lord is raised. So Peter gets up, runs to the empty tomb and finds it just as the women said. Well, who went? Was it Peter or was it Peter and the beloved disciple? We could say it depends which gospel you read, right? But then when you look at it, just 12 verses later in Luke, Luke says, when Jesus is talking to the Emmaus disciples, and they don't recognize him at that point, it says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Luke says, Jesus is saying, why the sad face, guys? Well, Jesus, you know, he died and on, Saturday, on Friday, he was crucified. But some of our women went to the tomb this morning and said it was empty. They saw angels. Um, and then some of our own went to the tomb to check it out. Some of our own went to the tomb to check it out. Wait a minute, Luke, just 12 verses later, you said just Peter. Peter would, or Luke would say, I didn't say just Peter. I only mentioned Peter. But obviously, I knew there were more because I'm saying some of our own went to the tomb. But Luke, John, we don't do that today. So they're writing according to the literary rules of their day. We have our own today, right? We do things differently. Uh, to, like today, we might speak in a humble sense and say, well, we did this last week when it really just I, because I don't want to say, well, I did this last week. So I try to couch that, make it a little humble sounding. And I say, we did this. Well, you wouldn't have done that in antiquity, right? Because that's a plurality of persons. Well, sometimes they did some things that we wouldn't do today. It's our responsibility to find out what they were doing and interpret in that way. These are differences, not contradictions. Third point. We have to understand about some of the the literary ways that they wrote back then. Now, a way that I'd like to describe this is there's the guy version of the story and there's the girl version of the story. <laughs> How many of you are married? Okay, you know what I'm talking about then, right? The guy version of the story is very succinct, to the point, get to the bottom line. I don't need all these details, okay? The girl version of the story has details, lots of details. <laughs> Guys, you know what I'm talking about. We're on the phone, we're telling the story to a friend, your wife's in the background saying, you know it didn't happen that way. <laughs> right? 
We're not trying to distort the story. We're not trying to deceive. We're trying to save our listeners who wouldn't be interested in those details to give 10 minutes of background knowledge that they don't care about. So we alter some details. We compress the story in order to communicate what really happened, but we do it in, in ways of economy, right? Let's hear it, guys. Yeah. The Gospels do this as well. Mark is our feminine author. Matthew is our guy author. Let's talk about the cursing of the fig tree. Here it is. This is Mark. He's given us the girl version, okay? Mark says that Jesus and his disciples got up early one morning, and they left Bethany, and they go to Jerusalem. (laughs) And on their way there, Jesus sees a fig tree. He's hungry. No figs on it, so he curses it. They go into Jerusalem. End of the day, they leave Jerusalem. They go back to Bethany. They get to Bethany. They spend the night in Bethany. The next morning, they get up. They fix pancakes for breakfast. (laughs) Jesus eats pancakes, but he likes Mrs. Butterworth's light syrup. He's on a diet. Matthew, on the other hand, likes butter on his pancakes. And Peter likes decaf. After that, they're leaving Bethany, and they go into Jerusalem again, and they see the fig tree. It has withered and died. That's Mark. Matthew gives us the guy version. Matthew says, they got up, went to Jerusalem, no figs, he cursed it, it died. Mark saying, Matthew, you know it didn't happen that way. They went in. Then they came out. It was the next day. They saw it. Matthew says, Mark, they don't care. All right? (laughs) Remind me of my wife. (laughs) I'm glad Matthew gives us the guy version. Why? Because ancient biographies had to be written on a single scroll, no more than 25,000 words, And by compressing stories, by giving us the guy version, sometimes Matthew changes details like that. By giving us the guy version of the story, guess what? Matthew can give us more stories about Jesus, which Mark doesn't have room to do. But I'm glad Mark gives us the girl version. Because Mark, in giving us the girl version, tells us more like what we might have seen had we been there. And that interests me. I'm glad we've got four Gospels. And once we start to understand this, and listen, I've only given you one of these little things, compression. I found six different biographical liberties that these guys took. Some of them we might not feel comfortable with today. Like sometimes they'll take a story that happened in one context, they will take it out of that context, and they will place it somewhere else and link it to something else. See, we wouldn't do that today. We wouldn't. But there were reasons why the particular authors would do that. I don't have time to discuss it, but it was right for them. In fact, they were told by literary instructors of those days, this is the kind of stuff you do. And again, they had reasons to do it. Once we start to understand these things, we say, these aren't contradictions. They're just writing according to the literary standards of their day. And we have to judge them according to their standards rather than imposing our ideas of modern precision upon them. I was talking to Big A uh, right before here, and he told me he's a photographer, and I'm an amateur photographer. You know, I, I love getting a good shot, and, you know, we, we focus in sometimes, and we can get all the other adjustments, but you push that thing, and if it's just slightly out of focus, you miss the shot. A lot of times in biblical studies, we try to come up with some answers to some different things, and it just falls short. We miss the shot. In many cases, what I'm finding is because when we look at the distant past, we adjust our lens as though they're writing according to modern standards, and so it comes out of focus. But when we adjust our lens to view the distant past using the rules of the first century, a lot more comes into focus. So number one, even if there were contradictions, it doesn't mean the Gospels are historically unreliable. They do not differ on these details any more than other ancient historians do when reporting a similar event. Number two, we have to be able to distinguish between a contradiction and a difference. 
And number three, these guys were writing according to the literary standards of their day, and there was a flexibility involved, kind of like the difference between a guy version and a girl version of the story. And in doing so, these, a lot of these, most of these aren't contradictions. Let me say that of the more than 50 pages of differences I found, there's probably only a handful that I still can't reconcile. The rest of them, they're all in the peripheral details, by the way, nothing major detail. And even with the peripheral details, there's only like a handful of them that I don't know the answer to yet. All right. But we're learning some really cool stuff as we're looking at these things over the years. I hope this has helped you. And as we approach this Easter, what I'm really excited about is, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. We've got evidence for it. But I hope this is encouraging to you to see that when we're reading the Gospels, we have what appear to be historically reliable reports about the life of Jesus. And so maybe you're going through something right now. You know, in 1997, I ruptured a disc in my lower back, and it caused horrible pain before I had my surgery. And I remember saying to my wife, I do not want to live through this for another six months. Those were back in the days of Jack Kevorkian, the death doctor. And I was thinking, you know, I can understand people going to him. This pain is so horrible. I'll bet you there's some people in here right now who have just horrible pain that they're living with on a constant basis. The Gospels tell us that the message, if they're historically reliable, and if Jesus rose from the dead, as it all seems that it's true, it tells us that we all matter to God. He cares about us. And it means that if you're going through that horrible pain right now, you just hang in there. A resurrection body is coming. And you're going to look back on this very, very brief life. And this life is just a testing ground for us. Maybe you just found out that, your sp that you or your spouse only has 6 to 12 months to live. All right, maybe you just found out that you have six to 12 months to live, and you're saying, how do I deal with this? This life is so short anyway. Be prepared to meet God. Our, God's will for us on this earth is not necessarily our happiness. It's our holiness. That is what he's after. He's not here to grant our every prayer request so that he can be a divine Santa Claus of some sort. He wants us to become like Jesus, and a lot of times the only way to do that is through pain and suffering. Maybe you just lost your job and you're wondering what's going to happen. Maybe your marriage just blew up. I don't know what it is, but, whatever, but God knows what it is. And whatever's going on, the Lord is aware of it. And what the reliability of the Gospels, what the resurrection of Jesus tells us, we do matter to God. And God, if we let him, will take this and work this together for our good to develop us into the person he wants. And ultimately, and when we are in heaven, that's really all that matters, what happens here on earth. I want to encourage you with these words. I hope it makes sense to you. Listen, got some stuff out on the, on the table out there, some books, one called Evidence for God, 50 Arguments for Faith from the Bible, History, Philosophy, and Science, in which we deal with a lot of the difficult questions. What about those who've never heard? What about babies and mentally handicapped? Is Jesus the only way? The reliability of the New Testament. How do we know Jesus rose from the dead? What about the creation-evolution debate? Did God create? All this kind of stuff in that book back there, 50 different articles on it. And I know Mark Middleberg's coming tonight. He's a good friend of mine. He is a great guy. Lee Strobel, many of you have heard of him. When Lee Strobel became a Christian, converted from atheism to Christianity, guess who discipled him? Mark Middleberg. Lee Strobel told me that Mark Middleberg is the godliest person he's ever met. You're going to hear him tonight. Come back and hear him. He is great. He's got a book out there too. And you know what I can tell you? That whether you buy Mark's books or, Mar or my books, um, all the proceeds go to needy children. Hours. <laughs> Great being with you all. Let me pray. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done. I thank you for this body of believers here today. You've been so good, and thank you for this great church. Lord, please bless these believers as they go out. Help this to encourage them to share their faith with more boldness and confidence. And Lord, even to strengthen their own faith. And Lord, for the, those who are truly seeking, who are here today, seeking truth, may they find it. In Jesus' name.